Hello everyone, welcome to my talk. I'll be talking about variability and accreting supermassive binary black holes. These are, these are uh, this is work uh, led by uh, myself and um, in this talk, and also by uh, Luciana Cambi, who's a graduate student, and the postdoc Federico Lopez Armengal at RIT. Uh, Luciano is at uh, the Argentina Argentino Radio Astronomia uh, Institute, and uh, he's he's going to be graduating soon. So yes, so this movie is the X-ray emission from accreting supermassive binary black holes that we ray traced with one of our simulations. And these systems are really exciting because they are the likeliest EM bright binary black hole systems. You know, LIGO systems aren't expected to be very bright because there's not going to be enough mass there to uh, accrete. And EM signals are going to allow us to maybe locate binary systems before they're detected in uh, by LISA, and so that we have candidates to see, to look at once LISA flies. And so this is really exciting, and we've like, explored uh, the possibility of detecting these things uh, in with X-ray telescopes in DELCON at all, 2019. So, however, we really need really good uh, theoretical models to, to, to know what we're looking for and to find them. And a variety of people a variety of groups are looking at this in different ways. So in Newtonian hydroviscous ways, in Newtonian MHD ways, we're looking at things in the post-Newtonian regime using GRMHD, and that allows us to look at how, <coughs> excuse me, the effect of the in-spiral has on the on the circumbinary disk, and also on how relativistic effects uh, alter the radiative mechanisms. And so we're we're really excited. To, to explore this regime because there's so much going on. So we're basically going to be, uh, we, we learned kind of this rich uh, variety of, of variability from, from uh, Dennis's work, Dennis Bowen's work, uh, where uh, we, uh, we, we embedded many disks uh, inside a circumbinary, in an equilibrated circumbinary disk, and we let it rip. We found that the circumbinary disk, after the mini disk strained, the circumbinary disk dumped material onto the onto the mini disk region and fed them, and uh, so and and that, that feeding modulated the signal. So if you take one of the mini disk masses and you follow it over time, you see that uh, its its fractional uh, amount fluctuates at, at a rate that is that is the beat frequency uh, between the Orbit of the lump. This is the lump is the over density region, uh, over density feature um, in the circumbinary disk that develops, and so this lump orbits the binary and dumps material on it at when a black hole passes nearby it, and so you you can see that 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 feeding is then going to operate at the B frequency between those two orbital rates, and that that's in fact what we see. Um, and so, so understanding the lump then is very important to understand the, 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 the modulated uh, accretion rate of the mini disks. And the mini disks are really the brightest thing in the system, um, it, which is not too surprising because we know from accretion disk physics the flux is always brightest um, close to the black hole. That's where most of the power is emitted. And so also it's also where the most variable emission is. So if there's going to be a signal uh, you know, of time variability, uh, that can be uh, key to discovering these systems and learning about these systems is through the mini disk variability. And uh, in this paper, we, we looked at this, the spectra from these systems, from uh, Dennis's sim simulations, and we found that over an orbit, most of the variability is from the mini disks. Um, however, um, that mini disk feeding, remember, is modulated by the lump accretion. So knowing how the lump is modulated. Um, over longer time scales, we, we will see even larger fluctuations. So, so knowing lump variability, we, we'll know how the mini disk uh, electromagnetic variability will, will happen. So what we did was we performed uh, a mass ra ratio survey um, just looking at the circumbinary disks. So we excised the region around the black holes, and that, that allowed, allowed us to take larger time steps, and that allowed us to evolve for longer. So we could equilibrate the system um, uh, better, and so we we looked at four mass ratios: one, one half, 0.2, and 0.1. So the mass ratio is m2 over m tot, and we we uh, we ran this for a while, and we saw that as the mass ratio diminished, the binary torques were were weaker, 
and that those binary torques, those gravitational torques, led to um, a less powerful lump. And this this sort of uh, uh, trend is is seen in in Newtonian simulations, um, and uh, MHD or in viscous hydro, that that the power in the lump, the amplitude of that overdensity feature, it diminishes. And so we would expect that the modulation from that lump also diminishes too. And we'll explore that. So how do we characterize when the lump forms? Well, we have to devise some sort of quantitative criteria, right? Else we're just kind of eyeballing pictures. But we want to develop a quantitative criteria. So what we did was we just simply looked at the m equals 1 mode. So this is the azimuthal, the, the first azimuthal mode. Um, uh, we, it's, so it's the mass moment. Um, and the amplitude of that moment divided by the amplitude of the zeroth order uh, moment, which is just the azimuthal average, um, led us to this criteria. We saw that in all of our simulations, including some initial uh, surveys of including different initial data sets, uh, we found that um, if this ratio reached a 0.2 value, it never returned back below 0.2. So it was a point of no return. So this was a good indicator that that the lump was forming, right? The lump was a significant part of the total power of the mass um, in the disk, and, and that it was trending up. So it was, it was, it was going to grow larger over time. Um, and so uh, we used this to characterize whether or not a simulation uh, developed a lump, but also when we started averaging this, the simulation to, to, to perform our, our uh, for your power series analysis. What's really important is the mass accretion and the luminosity of, of the disk. And so, so we see that actually in all the mass ratios, uh, the, the M dot and the, lumin and the light curve kind of follow global trends in the same way. So this is largely, we're, we're, you know, we're finding that this is large, largely governed by the initial data. So how much mass there is, what, what, how is it distributed, and how does it begin to accrete? And then the, as, as the transient decays, it's going to settle into more of a steady state. Um, and we'll see uh, longer simulations uh, by Federico later in this talk that demonstrate that. So, but however, if we take the time period of the lump um, and we take a Fourier power series, we see that there's a lot of power at twice the beat frequency between the, the binary and the lump. And that's because there are two black holes that, you know, Pass by the lump, and so that's twice the beat frequency. Now, as as, you, as the mass ratio diminishes, the secondary is going to be closer to the lump than the primary. The primary is going to be close to the center of mass, and so that secondary is going to be only in, interacting really uh, with the circumbinary disk. And so uh, you see here that that signal diminishes. Like Q equals 0.1, you don't see any sort of uh, weird uh, special signal. Uh, signal. And then that, and that, 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 that distribution is characterized by red noise. So that's what we see in a, in a generic single black hole MHD disk, is it's, it's just kind of red noise fluctuations. However, at higher mass ratios, you see that there are uh, specific signals in the disk. And so knowing, um, make, make, making these signals have higher quality and have, doing longer runs, we'll be able to then actually recognize an observed signal and match it to a mass ratio. At least that's our hope. So we, we do want to say, though, that, that even though these circumbinary disks don't have the mini disk um, uh, dynamics, these, the, the secretion rate does modulate the mini disk lumin you know, luminosity. And so we expect that, that some of these signals will carry over into, you know, kind of full domain simulations and, and modulate the uh, mini disk emission. So, okay, so on to spinning black holes. So this is uh, work that Luciano Combi and Federico Lopez Arangal led. And um, uh, Luciano is a, about to graduate graduate student and uh, Federico is a postdoc at RIT. And uh, they're collaborating with us on May improving the uh, efficiency of, of our space-time calculator. So not only does this allow us to add spins, but we're actually um, improving the, the runtime of the simulation so we can do more orbits more efficiently. So basically what, what we're doing is we're super, superimposing Kerr shield or Kerr, Kerr black holes onto a space-time and boosting them. 
and we're um, and and that boost is actually an orbit that is post Newtonian uh, accurate, 2.5 pn uh, accurate. And we demonstrate here uh, the Ricci scalar. So this is the violation from vacuum between the matching system, which we used before, which matched different approximations of different zones together: far zone, inner zone, near zone. Um, you know, the near zone was post Newtonian, inner zone was uh, post Kerr, and far zone was post Minkowski. So that's what we used uh, in earlier work, but now this superimposed system uh, performs really well um, and has uh, vacuum violations that are very close, comparable to the, uh, and sometimes better than the matching system. Um, the matching system does better close to the black holes than the superimposed, but um, uh, in 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 certain regions, uh, the the matched is uh, the superimposed is just as good, um, and just beyond the horizons, the the, the superimposed is actually better. So we use this to look at circumbinary disk evolutions for spins to see if there is any sort of spin imprint onto the uh, accretion rate. We found that there was not so much a spin imprint that they more or less appeared uh, similar. So you see the accretion rates of all these systems. But what we found was that if we ran longer, that all of them reached a pretty uh, similar steady state. So here, um, uh, Federico ran the, lo uh, the simulations uh, longer. We also saw that um, if we tuned, if we tweaked the random number generator that we used to to kind of uh, you know initialize the turbulence in the disk initially, that that we led to different evolutions, slightly different evolutions, right? The accretion rate and the luminosity were slightly different, and so that led us to uh, a measure of the realization variance in our simulations. Um, and that um, in and you know so the lumps here we show the the the. Uh, orbital frequency, o omega m equals 1, the orbital frequency of the lump and the eccentricity of the lump versus time on the left. And we saw that, okay, so the lump developed at different times for each of the simulations, and so that, you know, that's expected. But however, if we shifted the trends with respect to the time at which that simulation developed the lump, then we, then we saw that all of them followed the same curve. So that seemed, like, uh, seemed to suggest that the lump formation time was stochastic, was kind of random, dependent on the random number. But once the lump formed, that lump dynamics just uh, grew the same way as, as the other simulations did. So, so that means that the lump dynamics seems to be a pretty robust and ge generic feature of these simulations. Now, uh, with spins, you're, you're thinking, well, we're going to form jets now, right? Because you need spins to, to form powerful jets. And in fact, we do. And uh, in the lower left-hand corner is just a is a, just a comparison between match and superimposed uh, metrics, and we see very similar uh, dynamics. So that that's a non-spinning superimposed. So you see how, how how good it's behaving. And on the left, you see that uh, the the mass of the mini disks also have similar trends. Now the superimposed uh, metric doesn't have the the initial data wasn't tuned to the superimposed metric, so it had an initial transient that was larger, but after some time it, it developed the same uh, periodicity that the matching did. And but for the for the spin, so on the right hand side we plot the the, the flux of the electromagnetic ma emission, or really the pointing flux variation for, on top of the accretion rate at 30 M. So this is at near the edge of the circumbinary disk, and we find that this that the the, the two are modulated pretty closely together, uh, which is exciting because that that modulation is actually from the circumbinary disk. So that's from the lump. So the lump again is it's modulating the jets in these systems. Now in the lower right hand co corner is a movie of the pointing flux. Um, actually, it's just the magnetic field lines um, uh, on top of density contours, and you see how there's a powerful uh, ordered field that is powering a jet um, that, and it also oscillates back and forth. It kind of wavers as uh, perturbations in the disk uh, perturb it, um, which is really neat. So this is a movie moving with the black hole in a frame that is vertical in the in the in the x z uh, plane, moving with the black hole.
And I just want to leave with these conclusions. Um, thank you very much for attending my talk, and uh, uh, I appreciate any questions at the, during the question session. Thank you very much. Bye.